Hello and welcome to Smart Karma's corporate webinar. I am Vidhi Bhatt from the corporate solutions team at Smart Karma. This week, we are very happy to have with us Elite Commercials management team with us. We have Shaldeen Wang, the CEO. We have Jonathan Edmonds, the CIO. He will be joining in soon. We have Joel Chia, the CFO. We will start this webinar uh, with Charlene walking us through a corporate webinar, a corporate presentation about the company, after which the team will engage in a fireside chat with uh, Smart Karma analyst Sumit Singh. This will be followed by a live Q&A session, so I would like to request all our attendees to post their questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. During this webinar, I will also share links on how you can connect with Elite Commercial, uh, their IR team, as well as with Sumit. So keep a lookout for messages in your chat box. With this, I would like to hand it over to Shaldeen to take the webinar forward. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for spending some time with us this afternoon um, to listen to our presentation. Uh, Hongin, could we have the presentation being shared now? Thank you. Um, this is actually a, um, what we will go through today will be a presentation of our first half results. I will also in the meantime, um, bring about a bit of more information with regards to our tenants and also our portfolio. For those who have not actually been following us closely, it's more for an understanding of uh, who we are and uh, what we do as well. So um, if I could have um, page four, please, Hong. The next page. Okay. So uh, Elite Commercial REIT is the first and only UK focused Singapore REIT that was listed on the Singapore Stock Exchange last year. So we were quite glad to say that you know, we managed to get ourselves listed before the COVID onset. And what we are is that we actually lease most or almost all our assets to the AA credit rated UK government. So it's very specific um, investment mandate that we are, we are actually focusing on. Um, we have today 155 office assets across the whole of United Kingdom. This is inclusion of our maiden acquisition, which we did in March this year. All our properties are fully occupied, which means that we don't have any vacancy in our portfolio. And we have always been able to collect our rental um, in full and on time from the government. Our portfolio stands at 515.3 million pounds. And they are all led to the government uh, through something called the full repairing and insuring leases. In Asia, we commonly term that as a triple net lease, which means the government bears um, all the costs in terms of maintaining the property. And even in our cases, um, when it says full repairing, is that if there is any work that needs to be done on the property, any capex work on it, the government will be bearing them as well. Majority of our assets are sitting on freehold land. We have only got a couple, 3% of our total portfolio that is on very long leasehold. So which means that it's close to 100 or above 100 years uh, in, in terms of leasehold uh, years. Um, the whale today stands at 6.6 .6 years. Next page, please. So this shows, this is a map that shows the whole network of our assets across the United Kingdom so that you can see that it's actually not um, very much concentrated on any particular location or it's actually mainly located on the lighter gray shades, which is actually the more densely populated area in the United Kingdom. And majority of our assets are being used by this particular department called Department of Work and Pensions. And they are the largest public service department in the UK, which, so which means that actually our assets are all being used as a social infrastructure to provide the necessity um, of use by this department to administer its works to its people. Next page, please. So maybe a little bit more on um, who DWP is. So DWP is actually the largest public service department that administer mainly all the welfares, pensions, child maintenance policy. 
So that includes also things like the pensions for the older generations, the unemployment benefits to people who are unemployed, and the disabled benefits to people who are disabled. So with the onset of COVID, DWP sees a surge in terms of the claimants uh, on, their, uh, on their portfolio. Um, prior to COVID, they have been around 20 million claimants, but as of today, definitely there's over 22 million claimants reported. The benefits that the government has been distributing as of end of March 2021 was reported at 212.4 billion pounds. And that's increased from 190 billion pounds from the previous financial year. And this is expected to increase further for this coming financial year as well. Well, all the services are being administered through something called the Job Centre Plus. And these are actually the centres where they have the um, councils and also people who help um, the needies to go, go in and do applications and do um, verifications on whether they are suitable or they qualify for such uh, a scheme whereby they can actually claim on the government. So the government actually has, with the onset of COVID, pledged to the people that they will increase the number of job coaches on their site by 13,500 people. And that has been completed in March and it's still continuing to recruit more employees to serve the need because they need to get job seeker back into the workforce and to support these job seekers in their search of uh, an employment in the country. So throughout all the lockdowns in the UK, the Job Centre Plus locations remain open and it also has to adhere, adhere to all the social distancing measures. So COVID-19 doesn't actually um, create a scenario whereby there's any force majeure or there's any tenant that's leaving our assets. In actual fact, the assets are more used more than before because of the needies that need to actually come in to do more claims. Now, all our leases thus comes in with a built-in renter escalation clauses. Majority of them, um, that is actually, uh, actually um, those that are led to the government, has got this inflation-linked rental uplift that is stapled to the leases, which means that it's actually compounded via the actual CPI index. But there is a falling cap to it, so which means that we will get a minimum of 1% uplift per annum compounded, or a maximum of 5% should the CPI goes beyond 5%. So that is being compounded and the new rental rate will kick in on the 1st of April, 2023. So DWP being the frontline essential workforce for the national recovery, continues to serve their people through all the centers that is, um, that is uh, also being owned by us as well. And today we are actually the largest uh, landlord to this particular department in the UK. Next page, please. Next. Coming to a little bit of the financial highlights. So those um, previously what I've mentioned are the backgrounds and our tenants. Now, I think what's important is how we have performed for the first half of this year. Well, I would be very pleased to say that actually um, Elite Commercial REIT managed to outperform our results against both the IPO projections and also the actual of last year, since we've listed uh, in the first half of the year. We have also been looking at ways to future-proof our financials. So the, um, the manager has announced a few of these initiatives that we are currently working on. In addition, in this first half of the year, we have also completed a maiden acquisition, which sees the increase in our asset size and hence reflected in terms of our financials with the rental collections from these new um, portfolios that we have acquired. And the team is actively working on asset management and trying to ensure that there's more income visibility in our portfolio. So I'll go into a little bit more details on the respective of these items next. Yeah. 
So on this page, you could be you are able to see in the, in the performance in terms of the financials for us, in terms of the income available for distribution to our unit holders. Um, we have actually reported a 37.1% increase uh, from our IPO forecast. Uh, sorry, uh, from uh, uh, increase in, uh, yeah from our IPO forecast. And in terms of our distribution uh, per unit, we see the 8.7% increase from our IPO projection as well. Sorry, it should be projection, not forecast. It's the second year now. I apologize for that. Um, and definitely, this is a, uh, a confirmation of the acquisition that we have done uh, earlier of this year in March. And that's the impact of the new income that came into the portfolio. Next page. And in terms of a summary, this shows the, um, the variations and the variance with regards to the actuals and also the first half of 2020. Um, what we could say is that, you know, because last year we have listed on the 6th of February, so there's slight deviations in terms of the full whole one half of 2020 results as of last year. However, um, we have actually shown the, um, the performance, actual performance uh, with regards to this. And our DPU in terms of pens that has been reported for first half of this year stands at 2.63 pens. Next page. In terms of a balance sheet, I think we have a very healthy balance sheet. Um, the asset size, uh, assets remain stable. Our total assets is reported at 541.5 million pounds and our net asset value per unit at 62 pence. Next page. This is a summary of our debt maturity profile. Um, so you can see that there are different towels on each of the year. The total debt today stands at 228 million pounds, a gearing ratio at 42.1%. Uh, our borrowing cost is about 1.9% and the interest coverage ratio at 6.4 times. Um, we have actually hedged about 63% of our interest exposure um, till date. Can I have the next page, please? So what I've been talking about future proofing the REIT and you know, ensuring that uh, the financials are, are being um, strengthened and certain is that we have recently announced that we are actually going for a technical listing on the International Talks, Stock Exchange, TITSI. So this is not a listing whereby you actually trade the shares. Basically, all the units that are listed on Titsi will be owned by Elite Commercial REIT. Um, so which means that, you know, this is a technical listing rather than the actual share trading listings as we see on SGX. Well, the objective of this is actually to bring down the principal tax rate that is applicable to the REIT. So today, the current corporate tax rates that the REIT is paying is reported at 19%. Now, the UK government has already announced that by 2023, this is going to increase to 25%. So even before the, that announcement was made, studies has been done by the manager to see how we can actually max it up, minimize this tax rates to be in par with other UK REITs as well. So the idea of this technical listing comes about. So with the success listing of it onto the TITSI, we will be able to reduce our tax rate to 15%. Hence, we actually future-proofing our um, tax losses uh, through the increase in corporate tax in future as well. In addition to that, all the latent capital gains that we have actually um, gotten uh, in our books and also all the corresponding deferred tax liabilities will be eliminated through this process. So this is expected to be done this quarter itself, and we will be able to get, um, the, uh, or basically we will be able to get our unit holders to enjoy the benefits once the completion uh, has been done uh, for this particular technical listing. In addition to this uh, TITSI listing, 
this quarter itself, we have also implemented and established the distribution uh, distribution reinvestment plan, the DRP plan. We have actually hear responses from uh, or comments from our investors that has been brought up to us a couple of times. And we do see that, you know, uh, there are people who are keen to reinvest uh, the div dividends back into the REIT. Hence, we have actually put up this option for investors. So now unit holders could elect to receive the dividends uh, of, in, in the form of units as well, uh, in addition to you know, the original choice, which is just to receive it in cash. So next page. Um, I think this is basically a, a short summary of, of all the dates of this dividend, uh, the RP plan. Well, I guess the key thing that people will be more interested would be when is the um, when is the dividend being paid out? Well, it's on the 24th of September 2021 this year. That's the payment date for our first half dividend payment. Uh, next page. So, so much on the financials. Uh, let me come to this um, portfolio and asset management side of, uh, of the REIT. Well, as I have said earlier, 100% of our portfolio is being occupied. So we don't have any vacancy rate. Uh, we have a very long will compared to a lot of other commercial REITs in the market in Singapore. So it's a, it stands at 6.6 .6 years. One thing which we have been consistently able to report, and we are very glad to say that this actually um, justify the proposition that we have actually put forth at, at IPO, is the collection. Um, we have been able to say that within seven days of the due date, every quarter, we can, we can say that we have received um, the advance rent uh, from the government. So, which means that the government always paid their rent in full and on time. And that is the resilience of this REIT. And that's the reason why we have been able to pay our distribution that we have promised to our investors at IPO. Now for this first half of the year, we do have two lease events that comes up in our portfolio and they have been addressed respectively. Um, one is actually a property in Stevenage. So the tenant has confirmed that this break option will not be exercised. In, uh, and hence, the um, lease is now confirmed to run all the way to 2028, 31st of March. This provides a further um, rental uh, confirmation on this property. And hence, we would expect that they will have some impact on the valuation of the property when it comes to their end bells. Second property that we have got um, a lease event is a small property in Epson. So this property in Epson, uh, the government decides, uh, basically DWB decides to exercise the break option uh, in 2023. So basically, um, what we have done is that we have actually evaluated this particular property to see what are the other usage and what can we do better to enhance the value of it. And at the same time, we have also received a buy offer from a reputable buyer in Epson that is willing to pay more than 21% above the valuation to us for this particular asset. So the team is currently undergoing all the due diligence on the offer, and we will be coming back um, to make our announcements when, once everything is finalized. So I guess in this sense, um, this particular property has provided us with the uh, confirmation that our assets actually has got more potential than being used as just a commercial office itself. Because in the UK, um, commercial office are qualified that are under certain criteria are qualified to be converted into other usage for residential and that is one of the reasons why the valuations of different properties are slightly different as well so this is one particular property that has got a lease event this quarter and it has been addressed next page please this is the um lease profile of the portfolio um, I would say that uh, basically you will see that there is a 23 um, 
break options period, but all the leases are actually signed on a 10-year lease. Hence, it's actually expiring in uh, 2028. So as long as the government does not exercise the break option on their side, all the lease will automatically be run all the way to the end of the lease term. Um, our CIO, Jonathan, has just been um, relocated back to the UK. So he's currently now in London um, at the same time zone with the tenant and has been working very closely with the tenant to ensure that you know, our asset management plan has been taken uh, on board and um, we have more certainty in terms of and visibility in terms of our income in the future years. Next page. I'm not going to bog you down with all this. Uh, this is um, just a summary of our maiden acquisition. So what we can say is that we, with this acquisition, we have also diversified our tenant base and also increased um, more concentration into London area itself as well. And with this acquisition, we have actually included um, one of the largest uh, shareholder onto the register, being a European um, institutional investor known as Partner Reinsurance. Next page. This shows the breakdown of the different tenants that we have. DWP constitute to almost 93%, but we have slowly adding in other departments such as the Ministry of Defence, National Records of Scotland, um, Courts and Tribunal Services, uh, Environmental Agencies, and uh, and this is going to continue because that's where we are heading for in terms of our, our diversification in our tenant base. And in terms of the breakdown of locations, we will see that more than 30% is now concerned of our valuations of portfolio is concentrated in the London and the Southeast region as well. Next page. So the REIT has been performing very resiliently. Um, we have been outperforming as REITs index throughout the whole period since we have listed. Um, as with any other REITs, you know, there was some impact during the COVID period, but it has rebounded and recovered very quickly. We are continuing to engage our investors, um, such as this particular event that we are doing now. We are also reaching out to more research house for coverage of the REITs as well to get more investors to understand us and to understand the portfolio. Um, next page. So we're, I'm coming to the end of this presentation. In terms of market outlook, um, I would say that UK is recovering. Um, it has already started to slowly open up. The economy uh, is expected to grow at 7.25% uh, in terms of GDP growth for this year. However, the unemployment is still standing high. Um, the unemployment is expected to peak by 3Q this year because the um, furlough scheme is expected to end on the 30th of September um, this year. Well, in terms of the REIT side, we would say that we will continue to provide a very stable income and also distribution to all your holders as we are, we are not very impacted by the COVID-19 situation, nor are we impacted by the Brexit situation. We are continuing to look at um, acquiring and growing the REIT growth from the open market, third party sources, and also from the local pipelines that we get from our sponsors. So with this, I'll end the presentation and um, we'll open the floor to question and answers as well. Thank you, Shailene, for the detailed presentation and congratulations to you and your team for a good set of first half numbers. Yeah? It was pretty strong numbers uh, coming out. Uh, so what I noticed is most of the numbers are driven a lot by a recent acquisition. And uh, the natural question that comes to my mind looking at your kind of portfolio the way it is, it's mostly rented out to the government. These properties are somewhere between, I would say, they're not traditional office assets, but they're still office assets used by the government. In your view, how much of a pipeline do you have of these kind of assets? In the Just to give us an idea of these kind of traditional assets that are given kind of more than talks about. Yeah, I think maybe um, a bit of an understanding on the UK market here. Um, the government assets in the UK are not owned by the government. The government actually has already went asset light more than 20 years ago. So the assets are actually mainly held by investors. So it's in the third party hands. And there is a very attractive or active trading um, happening in the UK uh, with regards to this kind of uh, long leases um, uh, properties. 
So on our side, um, basically we have been looking at the portfolio in the market. Um, we have actually looked at uh, currently definitely more than 200 million pounds that we are looking at. But of course, everything has to become with the right yield. It has to be accretive. So of course, we have to weigh the difference um, sort of like pricing as well. And in terms of rover pipelines, we also have a healthy pipeline coming from the, the Swansons. Well, we know that for the REIT to acquire, there is also a long process of um, um, fundraising that's required. Um, the, the sponsors are willing to step in and um, when they see a portfolio that is uh, suitable, they can actually buy and hold it for us. When we are ready, we'll make the offer to buy the assets from them as well. So that is about um, more than 100 million that's currently being held under the uh, Rover pipelines. So I would say that it's a very healthy portfolio that we are looking at. Um, so it's a matter of time and also pricing that then we, when we can actually come back to the market to say that we are going for a second acquisitions coming up. Okay. And all these assets will be similar to your current portfolio. They all are rented to some government department. Yes. And then yes. They, yeah. they are. <coughs> yes. Uh, Char John, did, sorry, Shardin, do you, did you want oh. to take one of these questions? I didn't know. If, can you hear yes. me clearly? I could because I couldn't see that you have uh, come in uh, as John is now located in the UK. We do have some um, technical <laughs> issues here. No problem. John, why don't you take the acquisitions uh, question here? No, I think I think I mean, I think you've answered it pretty fully already. I mean, just a couple of extra points, you know, in terms of the UK government as a tenant. Um, actually, the UK government is the largest occupier of real estate in the UK. And as Sheldon mm -hmm. mentioned, as an organisation, they went asset light. So. The market has a, a, a very large number of kind of investment or kind of opportunities for us as a REIT and other investors to look at. Um, there are there are multiple departments um, of the UK government. Obviously, we, we are the largest landlord to the Department for Work and Pensions. That was the, the largest tenant in our initial portfolio and in the second acquisition. Um, but 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 beyond Ministry of Defence, um, HMRC, which is the tax collection agency. There are also departments such as the Environment Agency, Border Force, um, and very many others that um, that that, that uh, act as tenants in, in in office buildings all across the UK. So that gives us an opportunity to um, sort of you know undertake sort of careful asset selection. And really, what we're looking for is is buildings which produce the right kind of yield profile for the REIT, so that we can make accretive acquisitions. But where we think that the, um, that the that the buildings are used as a as a as a government facility, and therefore that the government is likely to remain in occupation for for a long period of time. That's that's our that's um, really the, what we're looking for as we make acquisitions. And yeah, as Shardin has mentioned, there there are about you know we're, we're actively looking at about two hundred and fifty million pounds worth of of assets at the moment to de determine whether they are suitable for. Um, for for us to go and acquire subject to the right market conditions and then again the the, the, the sponsor has a has a further pipeline of in excess of 100 million pounds worth of assets yeah and these are all office buildings let to the uk government in 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 good locations be it in in london and the southeast or in good regional cities um, thanks Jonathan, for that that uh, helps a lot so is it fair to say that at least for the next three to five years, your portfolio is pretty much going to remain similar, where you'll have most of your or most of your assets tenanted by the government? I know, I know. I think, I think, you, but yeah, I think, I think that I think you know for for so long, you know, when we set up this um, investment strategy, um, which was which was really focused on you know providing investors with a with a very stable. Um, income return as well as capital growth, but in a, you know, in a, it was it, it was very, you know, a defensive investment strategy. So it was built to be able to cope with the economic effects of, well, of, of, a, of a sort of of an economic shock such as Brexit. You know, Brexit seems like a kind of long time ago as an idea, but um, but but when we were doing the IPO, that's what most investors were looking at, and really there was no other there was no other uh, vehicle in the market that really just pr pr you know was able to provide investors with this highly defensive income um, but obviously since covid-19 the economic shock to the to the uk and, and global economy has been far greater than um, 
than one in, the one sort of envisaged by by Brexit. So, you know, that investment strategy is, has um, you know has helped this REIT perform extremely well during its first eighteen months of of operations, yeah. and and because we occupy a niche, and we we're beginning to better understand just through our existing relationships with various government occupiers exactly what you know as an organization they are looking for in terms of their property portfolio that they want to occupy as tenant you know we're, we're getting better at better at our work so i think for, for the time being and, and this is really in response to discussions that we've had with investors that we will continue to look at um at, at office buildings led to the led to the uk government focus just just on the uk for the, for the time being because that's what has enabled us to perform really strongly so far yeah sure. sure um yeah i mean that makes sense now that you put it in that light that you build a portfolio for brexit but you ended up uh, flying through covid <laughs> yes had, you know, <laughs> rental paid up front i mean that's that's you can't ask for better than that uh during those times um so i actually have a couple of questions and i also see that people who join the webinar have similar questions so i'll kind mm -hmm. of i think give them in as well um, one is obviously you have you seem to have quite a good pipeline of acquisition so the natural question obviously comes uh, what are you thinking about funding what kind of gearing levels are you comfortable with um, so if you could add a little bit of color on that uh, that will help yeah i can take this yeah so yeah so um, yeah i also spotted the questions on the q and a i think Generally, we, we, we do receive these questions that uh, the gearing is a little bit on the high side. So I just want to frame this uh, for investors as well. So MES actually provided a guideline in April 2020, where as long as your income coverage ratio, your interest coverage ratio is more than 2.5 times, the regulatory limit is 50%. So in other words, um, the, the, the framework has changed somewhat. 45% is no longer the base case. Now the framework allows for 50%. So that's it. The manager is not going to uh, go go uh, gangbusters and try to raise the gearing to that level. We are still very comfortable our long-term gearing ratio to be between uh, less than 40%. It's just that for this particular situation, um, we did explain to investors that as part of our maiden acquisition, the managers actually came up with two, two, two options of funding the acquisition. One buyer, uh, a mix of equity and debt and one via plan B, which is just to use all our internal resources and debt. So at the point of time of when making the maiden acquisition, uh, the manager viewed that the market wasn't that conducive or elegant for funding the acquisition elegantly. So we decided to take the, the, the short term uh, blip in terms of the higher gearing ratio with the intent to uh, address that shortly thereafter. So that is, um, so going forward, um, certainly, without a shadow of doubt, to grow, there will definitely need to be a mixture of uh, EFR and debt funding to fund new acquisitions. So that is something that the manager will be seeing, uh, doing in tandem as we look to acquire uh, future acquisitions. Yeah. Okay. And uh, thanks for that, Joel. Uh, now, one question I've always had uh, whenever I look at, and I looked at the structure at the time of the IPO as well is, uh, what's the traditional REIT uh, in Singapore, especially, which are mostly seated by the government entities, Keppel, Maple Tree, whoever sent this, these are like almost household names in Singapore, right? Um, you, for instance, have three sponsors, not, not mm -hmm. one, not two, but three. So I always wonder, like, what does everyone bring on the table and how does that help you kind of grow as a REIT as you go along? Right. I think it gives some, uh, got to give it a bit of a background. So when, you know, um, when we first started looking at this portfolio, um, we were setting it up like a private fund. So what happened back in 2018 was that uh, the founders are basically of Elite Commercial uh, REIT Sponsor, which is um, Elite Partners Holdings. So they were actually fund managers. It was set up by um, the ex guys from um, previously uh, Vivia, Viva Industrial Trust. So Victor Song actually founded EPH, uh, this group. And together with it, what came along was um, the Holy Group. So Holy was also the founder uh, or basically the sponsor for Viva. 
So if you could recall during that time, um, Viva was in the process of merging with ESR and hence forming the bigger ESR REIT. Um, and so the sponsor and also the founder was deciding to see, you know, what is there in the market outside of Singapore that could be of interest uh, as a REIT for the Singapore space. So we chanced upon this particular portfolio in the UK that was being um, put on sale and it has got a brand 10, a new fresh 10 year leases coming from the government. So it ticks a lot of boxes of what we are looking at and something that we don't have in Singapore yet uh, for our investors here. So that was the how, you know, if you look at three sponsors, two of them are actually in the whole group. They are actually also um, owning each other. Uh, Holy also owns EPC uh, in a way. So basically, we have one group of guys who has founded this. And when we were doing the private fund, we were trying to introduce this to other investors. And we come about, uh, we met up with um, this group called Sunway RE Capital. So it's actually a wholly owned subsidiary owned by the Malaysia Sunway Group. And they have always been trying to get into recurring business uh, apart from their own traditional development business. So in, in terms of um, visions, it come hand in hand. So the decision was then for the three of them to come along and form together the sponsor group for this week itself. At the same time, they were also the um, original sets of investors that have invested in a big portion of the, uh, the portfolio that we see is possible to bring to the uh, stock exchange because the U transaction in UK moves very fast. No one is going to wait for you to put this up into the portfolio and get it listed before you could acquire it. So we have to acquire it and then get it done. So how they actually then contribute to us now is that although they are not like, you know, the government um, entities who has got a lot of pipelines, they, mm -hmm. like what I said earlier, they have been helping us to build the, um, the role for pipelines. So while we are trying to build up the REIT and also trying to grow it, um, we can't keep going to the market and say that I want to raise a lot of funds. Transactions happens within a few days. So what they are doing is that they are helping us to look at what is the potential in the market. Assets that are being able to be acquired now can be acquired under a private fund. And then we will then be able to buy it of them. So if you look at the, the prices that we are acquiring, um, it's very decent. Uh, it's not the kind of developer cost that we are talking about. So in a way, they are trying to help the wheat grows um, this portfolio uh, in a timely manner, I would say. That makes that that helps um, at least with my understanding of the whole structure a lot. Um, now there are a couple of questions coming in about um, the lease expiry, and I also kind of had a question before I kind of pick on those questions. One thing that stands out about your REIT is that you're kind of inflation protected, aren't you? Because you have that CPI window of one percent, and in today's, I mean, a couple of months back. The news is all about inflation going out and rates going up. So if that were to happen, say next three, four years down the line, you will be kind of well protected because of your structure, right? Uh, but your structure, what I want to clarify is uh, your structure says the inflation, the sorry, the rental reset happens in 2023. So is that for the entire portfolio, like 100% of the portfolio resets in 2023? Or is it like a part of the portfolio, big chunk of the portfolio? And I think that kind of answers one of the questions about 63% of the asset being having a break option as well. Yeah, I, I, I can take this one. So, I mean, it's pretty much um, sort of 90, 94% of the portfolio has a uh, uh, index linked lease in it. And I think Shaldin briefly explained the, uh, the, way the, the way that structure works, which is that um, the rent rates were set originally in 2018, and then there's a rent review that happens uh, in 2023, so after the fifth year. Um, the rents will increase in line with um, CPI, so CPI increases by 1% or 1%, or I think it was close to 1.5% in, in between 2018 and 2019, and then um, another one and a half percent between 2019 and 2020, and those that those increases are compounded every year all the way up until 2023. So, what 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 is the case is that our um, that we are uh, until 2023 we are hedged um, against in, in inflation rises because we will because our rents will yeah for the majority of our portfolio the rents are going to increase 
in line with inflation. Um, beyond 2023, well, we're, we're just then relying on inflation being the reason that rents generally increase because we don't get the same increase in in um, 2028, which is when the leases would expire. So we are we're fully hedged until 2023, uh, and then after that, we're in, we're only hedged as any other. Uh, property company would be would be hedged that doesn't have inflation linked leases in, in its portfolio. So, um, in terms of the in terms of the break clause, there are there are less properties in the portfolio that have a tenant only lease break in 2023. Um, okay. So there's about 64% of the portfolio that has a has a tenant only lease break in 2023. Um, there have been a, a, f a few assets that, for one reason or another. The tenant had a lease had to notify the landlord um, either two or three years in advance of that of that March 2023 date, um, and um, they've included a property in Sunderland, a property in Bristol, uh, a property in Stevenage, all of which had the lease break notices removed or extended out. So the the the, the only asset where there has been a lease break which has been exercised by the tenant in advance is this property in Epsom, which Shaldine has mentioned. In fact, we, were, we, we continue to, to try and work and understand from the tenant why they've exercised that break clause because it's not 100% clear yet and we don't think they've yet made up their mind. But in the, but in the meantime, uh, we have received this offer to sell the building at significantly above valuation. Uh, and in any case, the rent is, and this is to answer a question that came in, the rent will will continue all the way through until until March 2023. So <clears throat> actually we have, um, uh, I, I suppose the final point I'd like to make on the on the, the, the lease, the remaining lease break notices that, that, that the tenant has in 2023. We, we're now, um, you know, and, and part of our ongoing tenant tenant relationship management is to, is to, is to maintain a regular dialogue with the tenant um, about this and other matters. So, you no, know, we'd hope to be able to, be able to come back to investors, um, you know, within the next six months, just to provide an update update on that on that on that issue. But it's something that we're working we're working hard with the tenant to to to, um, to come to a resolution on. I think our, our, the reason that we have stated in the past that it's so important um, how the tenant uses these buildings. So the tenant has. And what we've seen is, is, is almost a doubling in the level of activity in each of these assets since the onset of COVID-19. We've seen the government employ, you know, um, another 13 and a half thousand people to work in this it, it, for, for, the, for the Department for Work and Pensions across its portfolio. So our, our sense is that the, the likelihood of the tenant exercising a significant number of break clauses would be quite low. So I've, I've answered several questions there so i hope that's all clear but do let me know if you've got any points you'd like me to um to, you know to provide a bit more detail on yeah i just i just had one question on the back of what you just told us jonathan um do you by any chance on the top of your head have uh, any recall of how long the government has actually been in some of these assets because i know you've only owned them for a couple of years but if they've been around for 20 30 years in the same asset then these clause is like a technical thing right almost i mean it, it, the, the government have occupied, from what we know, the government have occupied these buildings for uh, at least uh, 23 years now or since they were constructed. So the government went asset light in, um, in uh, about 1998 and, um, and, uh, and by going asset light is essentially um, put a whole load of of its freehold estate into an SPV and took a 20-year um, PFI contracted lease um, back from that SPV. And it's only when that contract came to an end in 2018 that um, th actually it's the first time these assets were available to acquire on the, on the open market. And that's, that's what Elite did. It, it, it bought these properties at that time. So what we know is that you know the majority of these assets have have always been occupied by a government tenant by a government tenant so in, in some cases that's you know 30 40 years and in other cases you know because the properties were only constructed in you know 
you know, 10, 10 to 15 years ago since, since they were constructed. So on the whole, the government have been occupying these buildings for a very long time. Maybe one point just to add, um, sorry, Sumit, just on one point to add here is that, you know, when the government decides on which are the locations that they want the Job Centre Plus to be in, they have um, certain criteria. So they, these properties, when they had a val, um, sort of like evaluation done in 2018, they have actually um, this sort of like evaluated in the whole region, basically um, where are it's located because they committed to the people that they should be able to access to one job center plus within 25 minutes of the transportation time. So there are certain criteria that they are selected. It's not as if like, you know, you can just move into another building uh, easily. There has to have certain um, uh, credentials in that, uh, in that particular location for it to be selected. Okay, thanks, thanks, Jenny. Uh, I think I just about a time to squeeze in maybe just one last question. Um, there's someone asking about, uh, do you do any hedging on a distribution? I think you pay out in uh, pounds, right? So you don't really hedge it, do you? So, so I think uh, for, for just uh, for the benefits of investors, right? So the whole vehicle uh, has been structured in such a way with uh, minimum hedging risk. So all our functional and reporting currencies are in pounds. Our distributions are declared in pounds. So, and our trading itself is in pounds. So we, we structure in such a way that our asset liabilities are pretty much, uh, there's no mismatch. So there's a very little need for any FX hedging. On the interest rate side, um, we have hedged about 63% of our interest rate exposure by fixing 63% of uh, whatever interest rate that we have. So I think essentially this vehicle is uh, structured in such a way to create a peace in mind for investors. The FX is very, there's, there's no FX, there's not much FX mismatch and the interest rate, we have hatched majority of the interest rate exposure. Yeah. Um, thanks, Joel. I think you're kind of running low on time, so I'll have to hand it back to Vidhi. I think you managed to answer most of the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sumit. Thank you for some very interesting questions. We had some really good questions coming in from our attendees as well, so thank you so much. I would also like to thank Shaldeen, uh, Jonathan, Joel for a very detailed insight into elite commercial REIT and uh, you know the whole REIT sector in UK. Uh, I would also like to thank the attendees who were able to join us live today. Uh, with this, we will wrap up this week's corporate webinar and we will see you again soon. Thank you and have a great week ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.